This online lesson on William Shakespeare's play Macbeth concentrates on Act 2, Scenes 1 and 2. In the first scene, which takes place in Inverness Castle, where Duncan, Banquo, the family of Duncan, as well as a number of important courtiers of Duncan, have come, are being hosted by Macbeth and Lady Macbeth on the occasion of the proclamation of Malcolm as the next king. In this scene, we see an important interaction between Banquo and Macbeth and their responses to the future of Scotland as well as their own place in that future. At the beginning of the scene, there is a short interaction between Banquo and Fleance where Shakespeare introduces the figure of Fleance, the son of Banquo, one of the sons of Banquo, and uh, where uh, Fleance, uh, where Banquo says uh, that uh, how goes the night boy and Fleance says the moon is down, I have not heard the clock. This, this short interaction between Banquo and Fleance uh, just before Macbeth enters is Shakespeare's way of a short indication of the introduction of Fleance in the play who will be brutally murdered by criminals hired by Macbeth later. A short introduction adds to the villainous nature of the act which, which Macbeth will commit a little later and uh, just after the short interaction between Banquo and Fleance is completed Macbeth enters and uh, Banquo unsure of who has entered in the darkness says who is there and Macbeth says a friend by this time we should remember that Macbeth has become adept at the art of misconstruction has become adept at different at uh, faking appearances with reality and he has become adept also at equivocation just like the witches for example he says something and means something entirely different for example when he says that he's a friend to Vancouver of course he hasn't really come to demonstrate his friendship but to almost test Banquo's position, Banquo's allegiances. And uh, Banquo says that all's well. I dreamt last night of the three weird sisters to you. They have showed some truth. Macbeth, I think not of them. The way in which Macbeth completely denies having any kind of remembrance about the words of the witches, any kind of remembrance about the temptations of the witches, makes us realize that whereas on the one hand Banquo is giving space to a genuine curiosity, a genuine a sense of desire for knowledge, Macbeth is here hiding that sense of curiosity and almost negating that sense of a desire for knowledge to Banquo, which is to say that Macbeth is gradually distancing himself from his friend. This, this short interaction between Macbeth and Banquo also tells us the two ways, the, the two different ways in which these, these characters respond to the words of the witches. And Banquo says, and this line is very important, my bosom franchised and allegiance clear, I shall be counseled. It is in this place that Shakespeare establishes Banquo as the morally neutral character and the morally central character in the play. It is against Banquo's morality that Macbeth's immorality is to be measured. It is against Banquo's pure allegiance that Macbeth's lack of allegiance is to be understood. Towards the latter part of the scene, after the exit of Banquo and Fiance, there is Macbeth's very important hallucination soliloquy or the hallucination speech where he imagines about this floating dagger. It's also called the scene of the floating dagger and the scene is a build, build up. It's a, it's a climactic way in which to reach on to the murder scene which is act one, scene two. And Macbeth says, is this a dagger which I see before me, the handle toward my hand, 
come, let me clutch thee. I have thee not, and yet I see thee still. Here, there is a difference between Macbeth actually seeing the dagger and not seeing it, between vision and lack of vision, between sight and lack of sight. This discrepancy or this difference highlights two very important things about the role of the supernatural and the role of the fanciful imagination in the minds of the Elizabethan audience and in the understanding of the Elizabethan psyche and and, and as, as well as the reception of this whole scene and its psychological implications for a modern audience because <laughs> Even in Elizabethan England, where there was a lot of belief in witchcraft and demonology and, and this kind of belief was substantiated by the ruler of the kingdom, King James I, we know, had written on witchcraft and demonology. He was a believer in the theoretical understanding of all of this and, and therefore it was a belief amongst the Elizabethan audiences also. But there was also... If there was on the one hand a belief that these supernatural hallucinations, that these supernatural ideas could be real, there was also a sense of doubt in the minds of the Elizabethan audience who felt that these were things which were conjured, which did not exist in reality and therefore they were completely fanciful or fictive in nature and Shakespeare's Macbeth in this hallucination speech is giving voices to both of these ideas one the complete belief that the world of the supernatural and the objects of the supernatural actually exist and also to a completely much more um, to a comparatively modernist mind which doubts that these actually exist so it's both that I have thee not and yet I see thee still there is also a, a predictable nature in this speech because he says that, that art thou not fatal vision sensible to feeling as to sight. It's important that this vision is called fatal because it's building on to the, fit, the fatal nature of King Duncan's murder. And there is also a continuation of the fragmentation between the hand and the I, which we talked about in the last act, there was something about Macbeth's eyes not wanting to see what his hand would do. And here he says that all of this, this, this dagger is ultimately of the mind. It's a false, cre it's a false creation proceeding from the heat oppressed brain. Of course, he's saying that that he's extremely stressed, that he's extremely uh, pressured under a lot of pressure and therefore uh, it's it's his mind is creating fictive images but of course this question mark also posits a doubt so if Shakespeare is saying that all of these are the result of Macbeth's seat of pressed brain then Shakespeare is also questioning that and he's making Macbeth question that you see in this speech and in, in, in most of Shakespeare's soliloquies as we discuss in most of Macbeth's soliloquies as we discussed there are a lot of meanings which come out there there are meanings of course which come out at the level of the conscious but there are also subsequent meanings which come out at the level of the subconscious and the unconscious and therefore when Macbeth is saying that uh, it, it could be a dagger of the mind a result of the heat oppressed brain that's the conscious meaning but the question mark is also putting uh, or, or moving us towards the level of the subconscious meaning which which doubts all of this and uh, he says that mine eyes are made the fools of the other senses a complete breakdown of the self of Macbeth where the eyes are working in one direction and the other senses or the other body parts and the other experiences are completely becoming divergent and moving to different parts and he says that there's no such thing it's the bloody business which informs us to mine eyes now or the the other half world nature seems dead the this this whole reference about nature seeming dead and also a reference to the to the netherworld to the dark forces to the to the subterranean forces of the mind are uh, shakespeare's extremely modernist and psychological way of giving a representation to the world of the or to the understanding of the subconscious 
through these nether forces or the dark forces and uh, here uh, Shakespeare is also conjuring very powerful images from the world of witchcraft and demonology wicked dreams abuse the curtain sleep witchcraft celebrates pale Hecate's offerings and withered murder alarmed by his sentinel the wolf this is this whole reference to the world of the mother of the witches Hecate the wolf is and the, the and the whole uh, atmosphere of witchcraft and and demonology is the world from which the witches hail and shakespeare is saying that this kind of world and this kind of an environment is gradually seeping into macbeth so the kind of scene which opened the play as an external environment by the time act to scene one comes we see that that environment is gradually residing within Macbeth and then there is of course an image of extreme sexual violence where uh, Shakespeare is talking about Tarquin and and this and the figure of Tarquin uh, gradually moving towards the female figure and uh, establishing a kind of uh, uh, a and uh, a sexual imposition and a sexual violence and this uh, uh, image is is taken from uh, Shakespeare's uh, poem his his long narrative poem the rape of Lucrece where the Roman king Tarquin rapes Lucrece and uh, here uh, even though the image is that of a sexual violence and a sexual uh, destruction and 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 the uh, sexual uh, is, is is of a sexual nature here the relation to macbeth becomes very clear because if we see the relationship between macbeth and king duncan and we understand a uh, king duncan in terms of his meekness in terms of his mildness then the murder perpetrated on the king is almost like a violation of the self so the kind of violation of the self which tarquin perpetrates on lucrece is here compared to the violation perpetrated on king duncan by macbeth and uh, towards the end of the speech he says that the very stone spread of my whereabout and take the present horror from the time which now suits with it and he says that there are inanimate objects like the stones which talk about of what he is doing so uh, macbeth gradually becomes aware that even um, dead objects are becoming alive and and they are talking about his crime this is really the voice the very subconscious voice of uh, macbeth which is speaking out to him saying that what Whatever you are doing there will be a number of witnesses to your act and you really cannot stop stones from speaking and you really cannot stop the skies from turning red and screaming out your crime and the bell rings it's almost like a funeral bell tolling the death of duncan and i go it is done the bell invites me here is not duncan for it is a nil that summons thee to heaven or to hell this is confusion about where duncan will actually go after his death whether it's heaven or it's hell is almost macbeth's response or macbeth's voice that the kind of action that he is going to commit whether it will be a good action or a bad action it really depends on the or or it will really influence the kind of death which duncan will receive if for him it's a wrong act then of course duncan will go to heaven but if he does something right and duncan is wrong was in the wrong then he will go to hell therefore this soliloquy also demonstrates the extreme confusion that macbeth is under in this scene and in this position in the play this next scene is about the interaction between lady macbeth and macbeth before the murder of duncan and the latter part of the scene that is act 2 scene 2 comprises the murder scene there may also be questions separately on a different the significance of different scenes in shakespeare's play uh, namely the opening scene the 
murder scene the dagger scene and here we come to the murder scene and after this subsequently there will be the potter scene and the sleepwalking scene so um, in this short interaction uh, between Macbeth and Lady Macbeth uh, we are not really uh, only dealing with a psychological interpretation of their uh, character which we had done in the course of the previous act the latter scenes of the previous act but also how they logistically plan an action which will say a lot about how they will plan future actions in the course of their lives so lady macbeth says that which hath made them drunk hath made me bold so he had made the guards of a uh, duncan uh, drink a lot of wine and even though she herself hasn't partaken of that wine it has made her extremely bold it has helped her quench her uh, natural self and and assume uh, something which is cruel in nature that which we discussed in the previous scene that she should be unsexed and she should be made cruel the wine has done something like that it has worked as the perfect external influence and here even lady macbeth refers to a number of uh, images from nature about the dark nether world of nature where there is the shrieking owl and um, that which is uh, creating an extremely a uh, gothic atmosphere so uh, if there is a gothicism in macbeth's subconscious then that gothicism is also reflected in nature here i really want to pause and make you all remember that this relationship between human nature and external nature is something which is very interconnected in the minds which was very interconnected in the minds of the elizabethan audience which is to say that whatever happened in the external world would be reflected in the minds of the people and whatever happened in the minds of the people would then be reflected in the external world so it was a very close relationship and therefore if a human being committed something unnatural nature would really cry out in its most unnatural ways and therefore since macbeth's mind here is gradually becoming very dark the external nature is also being interpreted in terms of a certain darkness and a certain brutal and and and, and a certain gothic environment and uh, macbeth uh, who is there what ho uh, lady macbeth alack i'm afraid that they have awakened and it is not done the attempt and not the deed confounds us and um, uh, she says and this line is very important had he not resembled my father as he slept i'd done it so here lady macbeth says just like macbeth in the previous act had given a number of reasons why duncan should be murdered because macbeth was his host macbeth was his loyal kinsman macbeth was also like his son there is also lady macbeth who is saying that uh, even she shouldn't uh, she she cannot in fact she didn't have it in her to to murder duncan because he resembles like his father this establishment of a kinship relation between the murderer and the murdered is here both on the part of macbeth as well as lady macbeth makes us understand that shakespeare is here not talking about murder in a very secular sense of the term here shakespeare is talking about murder as a destruction of a familial bond so if you are murdering a criminal that may be all right but if you are murdering a father figure of course you are doing something extremely unnatural and therefore even though lady macbeth does not suffer for it right now she would suffer for it quite later and it would be uh, brilliantly demonstrated in the sleepwalking scene how her guilt returns to haunt her and uh, Macbeth says her who lies in the second chamber and Lady Macbeth says Donald Bain Macbeth this is a sorry sight when Macbeth actually looks upon the murdered body of the king that 
person who was an obstacle to the fulfillment of all his future desires and future ambitions that person who was removed and he could achieve a greatness in its completion this act is being called a sorry sight and this is the little bit of conscience which is still intact in Macbeth, it's important to understand that when we are tracing the tragic development in Macbeth's nature, we are to trace how his conscience gradually removes itself. Is his villainy sort of overrides his voice of conscience and his voice of understanding that this is right and this is correct. And here, even though we have talked about how Macbeth has become adept at uh, appearances, at, at fooling other people, at, at equivocation or rather, had at, at saying something and meaning something entirely different there's little bit of the conscience in the character left and this voice of conscience says that whatever has been done it's extremely bad it's extremely sad and uh, lady macbeth of course repudiates at this point because she has a foolish thought to see a sorry sight it's important also to remember that lady macbeth is able to repress her voice of conscience quickly more quickly than Macbeth therefore when that voice of conscience returns which Freud has called the return of the repressed when it returns it haunts her in a much more powerful way than it haunts Macbeth we must understand that just like Macbeth is able to repress his voice of conscience slowly, that return of the repressed is also in a similar, gradual and slow manner. But for Lady Macbeth, it is something entirely. The, the pace is, is much more faster, both in terms of diminishing the voice of the conscience as well as return of that voice of conscience to haunt her. And uh, Macbeth here says that one cried, God bless us and amen, said the other, as they had seen me with those hangman's hands, listening their fear, I could not say amen when they said, God bless us. And of course, here you have a marvelous uh, reference to that voice of conscience being complete completely repressed because he couldn't say amen he couldn't say that that word of the final peace and the final prayer and this this lack of being able to say amen will will haunt him throughout then uh, lady macbeth says that uh, what, what do you mean and and here macbeth is the, the metaphor of the sleep in this play is very powerful where uh, lady macbeth says these deeds must not be thought after these ways so it will make us mad these two lines very important where lady macbeth understands that if we begin thinking about these things it will really drive us mad lady macbeth understands that what they had done was uh, not quite correct and therefore uh, the, the her voice of conscience tells her that it, it shouldn't be thought about otherwise it will make them mad and Macbeth responds and and he really cannot repress that so easily so he says that me thought I heard a voice cry sleep no more Macbeth does murder sleep the innocent sleep sleep that knits up the raveled sleeve of care the death of each day's life sore labors bath balm of hurt minds great nature's second course here of course the relationship of calm and peaceful sleep to the most normal course of nature is very important to be able to sleep at night, to be able to have a peaceful calm and a rest at the end of the day is so natural for human existence and if a person doesn't have that it's the most unnatural of things and here Macbeth is saying that since he has committed something so unnatural therefore the, his calm rest at the end of a day and his calm rest of sleep will forever be denied to him and and this is the kind of suffering that Macbeth will have to endure and uh, Lady Macbeth 
retaliate, saying, In form of purpose, give me the daggers. The sleeping and the dead are but as pictures. It is the child, it is the eye of childhood that fears a painted devil. If he do bleed, I'll gild the faces of the grooms withal, for it must seem their guilt. It's very important to note that here Lady Macbeth is doing everything which is logistically and practically required to cover up their steps that they hadn't committed the murder and Macbeth is the person who is really concentrating on his own self on his own responses as to how they will and how they will respond to and how they will respond uh, and how they are going to respond to this whole action so uh, it, it's it's important that we understand that even though both of them were party to the crime of murder it is one who is dealing with the logistics and the other with the psychological aspect of it and then there's the important series of sound images or auditory images in the play and the first of which is the knocking this this image of knock knocking will become very powerful in the potter scene and uh, Macbeth says, when is it that knocking? How is it with me when every noise appalls me? What hands are there? How they pluck out mine eyes? Again, this great incident of the, the, the hands and the eyes working in an extremely uh, different and their own independent ways. And the next image of how the whole of the great seas will turn incarnatine or turn red here uh, Shakespeare is employing also a number of color images to say that the 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 visual it's it's talking about or it's highlighting the visual imagination of Macbeth we must understand that uh, what Shakespeare's Macbeth just like a number of his tragedies are also poetic plays they are poetic dramas one of the ways in which these become very are, are, are great examples of poetry dramas is through the use of images of brilliant visual imagination where you can actually picturize Macbeth's increasing guilt by picturing great seas becoming red and uh, you can see the sea god Neptune and the ocean being washed with blood and lady macbeth says very important my high uh, hands are of your color but i shame to wear a heart so white here lady macbeth lady macbeth's hands are actually uh, filled with blood it's it's stained with blood the word stained is very important it's stained with blood because even after this blood it's here it's very literal because she's dealing with the knives uh, or or the dagger through with which the murder of Duncan was committed and whilst removing and adjusting those um, on the bodies of the on, on, on the cells of the guards uh, there was blood stains on her hand but even after these blood stains will be, will have been washed away in the sleepwalking scene much later in act 5 she will feel that these blood stains are still there in his hands and she, she really cannot wash them away so if Shakespeare is using brilliant Im images of visual imagination Shakespeare is also using recurrent images images which figure again and again with differing and evolving implications and one of the most brilliant examples of Shakespeare's recurrent imagery is the blood imagery in this play and the scene ends with that auditory image of the knocking which will begin the next important scene that is the potter scene we must remember that here sound is not just to create a kind of an auditory imagination it's to also it's, it's also working as a comprehensive image of of, uh, of 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 a resounding environment which is proclaiming the the kind and the nature of the action which macbeth has committed